as you know, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, and then God's people entered into a dark period where they had lost the gift of prophecy up until the ministry of John the Baptist and Christ and then the apostles. And then it seems to disappear again after the apostolic era. I'm going to read some history. The book of Maccabees is good for history. And I'm going to read 1 Maccabees chapter 4 and verse 46. I'm going to read three verses from the book of Maccabees. The book of Maccabees is placed at the very end of the hidden book of the Apocrypha, which used to be in the King James Bible. And laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to shew what should be done with them. So they're laying up stones and they didn't know what to do with them. So they were going to wait until a prophet could come and show them. Now that's interesting. That tells us that there was no prophet in the time of the Maccabees. Now, just a little backstory on the Maccabees. So to either refresh your memory or for those who might not know, the Maccabees were those who overthrew the, the Greeks. The Greeks were desecrating the temple. They were bringing in the most worst uh, apostasies and abominations uh, into the church. And so the Maccabees led a rebellion, a revolt, a holy rebellion, a holy revolution against the Greeks. And they were successful. And by the help of God, they were, they successfully overthrew the Greeks. And so it was during the era of the Maccabees that we went from the hips or the thighs of brass to the legs of iron. It was in that time span. And so the Maccabees, uh, this would have been in the mid uh, second century. So, you know, once one, one, one sixty ish. Okay. That's when it would have been. So around that time, there were, there was not a prophet. Now here's another witness. So there, so was there a great affliction in Israel, the like whereof was not since the time that a prophet was not seen among them. So was there a great affliction in Israel, the like whereof was not since the time that a prophet was not seen among them. So there's a connection between affliction and not having a prophet. Here's another witness, also from the same book, and that the Jews and priests were well pleased that Simon should be their governor and high priest forever until there should arise a faithful prophet. Okay, so shortly before Christ, about a century and a half before Christ, before the Messiah would come, they didn't have a prophet in Jerusalem. Malachi was during the era of Ezra and Nehemiah. These were prophets, and they went back and rebuilt the temple, right? And, and they were prophets, and that's those were the last. Now, I have a theory. It's a theory. And during the Persian Empire, the prophets have a public ministry. So they are known. It is apparent that there's a prophet. Uh, that there's prophets among them. They, they declare that they are prophets. They do not hide the fact. Now, during the Greek Empire, something changes where are there still prophets? Are they messengers? If you look at most of the apocryphal writings, the hidden book, which was being produced during the time span of the Greek empire. They don't claim, they don't claim their works. It's hard to know exactly when these books were written and who wrote them. It's, it's, it's a subject of much debate. But obviously, the wise should understand the Apocrypha. 
That's something that Miss White says. Said they should be studied. They used to be in the King James Bible and even the even the old Protestants. Even the old Protestants, although they weren't sure if they were inspired, they thought they were profitable. Maybe a helpful analogy would be, for those of the Adventist faith, would be we have spirit of prophecy, but we also have pioneer writings. So that's how I would, that's how I would say the old time reformers saw it. Now, the Apocrypha could be more elevated than that. That's my personal view. I tend to have a more elevated view of it. But nevertheless, if, 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 if you can see it as something that's edifying and something that you should read, then you're doing well. Now, when we get to the Romans, we seem to enter into a very dark period where it eventually gets to the point where it doesn't seem as if any apocryphal writings are, are being written. So again, that's my theory that during the Persian Empire, and this, this the first point, the first part of the theory, that can be proven true, that the prophets have a public ministry. And then when we get to the Greek Empire, there's writings that are coming up. There's writings that are being produced, but people aren't claiming their works. And then it seems that when you get to Rome, things get even worse. And I believe that this theory checks out with the Bible, and we'll get to that. Now, I'm going to read from Luke 13. The same day there came certain of the Pharisees, saying unto him, Get thee out, and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go ye, and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils, and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Now, I want to hone in. Before we read the, the rest of this prophecy from Christ, I want to hone in on that word fox. Why is he calling Herod? Daniel chapter 11, verse 23, has the answer. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. Now, this is speaking of Rome. You can get the context of that by reading the few verses before that. You'll read about Augustus. You'll read about Tiberius. And then the Bible takes a step back and gives you a bird's eye view of everything. And it talks about the how Rome came to be. Now, this prophecy of Daniel meets its fulfillment under the reign of the Maccabees. And the recording of the fulfillment of this prophecy is found in the book of Maccabees. So you see how important the, 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 this book is? and um, why it should be read. We have the recording of prophecy here. Now, Judas had heard of the Romans that they were mighty and valiant men, and such as would lovingly accept all that join themselves unto them, and make a league of amity with all that came unto them. Neither shall victuals be given to them that take part. So what I'm reading about now in this in this third paragraph on the screen is I'm actually reading from about the league that was prophesied of by Daniel a long time ago. Now the Maccabees are talking about the league. And now I'm going to read from the league and look what it says. Neither shall victuals be given to them that take part against them or weapons or money or ships as it has seemed good to the Romans. But they shall keep their covenants, and that without deceit. This goes to show you how magnificent the Bible is. The very word, the very word that Daniel uses to describe this power that would come up as a small people, the very characteristic, the very word that God uses to describe them, they condemn themselves with. 
they promised in this league that they would not work deceitfully, and then they would, right? And it's all there in the statue. They formed this alliance with the Romans, and now the Romans would subjugate them. Now, this couldn't happen until after 158 BC, and I'll give you the evidence for that in a second. If we just look at the right, the very far right-hand side of the screen, there's a couple different dates here. 168 is when Rome conquered Macedonia, and, and there's a prophecy in Daniel 8, as you see it represented in a drawing, where a horn, another horn is coming up out of one of the four horns, right? Rome is coming up out of Macedonia. They're entering into the vision. Now in 161, Daniel 11.23 was fulfilled. But they were still, even though they'd formed the league with the Romans, they were still being occupied by the Greeks. And it wasn't until 158 that the last Greek ruler would fall. So we're still, we're still in the in the in the phase of the brass. Until 158. Now, if I go to the next chapter in the book of Maccabees. This chapter, the chronologers say that this happened in 158 BC, whereof when Jonathan had knowledge, he sent ambassadors unto him. To the end, he should make peace with him and deliver them the prisoners. So they're doing a prisoner exchange, which thing he accepted and did according to his demands and swear unto him that he would never do him harm all the days of his life. So they they had thrown up they had thrown off the last Greek ruler, and they're doing the prisoner exchanges, and that sounds like a treaty. They're giving each other their words that they're going to um, enter into a time of peace. Now, was it technically a treaty? I don't know that, but just it sounds like one. Okay, so 158. So that that's established. So what is 158? 158 is when we can now transition to the legs. We can't transition to the legs until that date. Because the Greeks were ruling up until that time. Now, what's very, very interesting is that they're now under control of the legs. And how long do the legs go for? How long... How long are they how long are they being persecuted by the legs of iron? How long are the legs of iron trotting them down underfoot? 666 years. That's an interesting number. So from the end of Greek supremacy to the time that the daily desolation is taken away is 666 years that the pagan realms were doing it. And this is the beginning of Catholic supremacy. Clovis puts on the purple. He's a Catholic king, and I have a Catholic king in Rome. He's baptized in that year. There are two riddles. There are these two parables in the book of Revelation. And they start with, here is wisdom. And they both speak of Rome, so therefore they're related. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score and six. Well, we know who that man is. That man is the Pope, and there is his number on the left-hand side of the slide. Have we counted the number of the beast, though? We've certainly, we certain ident we've certainly identified the number of the man. It tells us to count the number of the beast. It is the number of the man. Perhaps your view is that is counting the number of the beast. We need to go no further. But I just want to say that there was, that William Miller had a position on this. And how would you count the number of a kingdom? How would you do that if you were asked to do that? I want you to put that thought on hold for a second. Remember, it is the number of a man. And when it's speaking of the papacy, when it's speaking of the popish power, the Bible says, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. This is interesting. The other horns don't have eyes like a man. They're not described as to have a face, but this one has a face like a man. And then the prophecy says it's the number of a man. And it's six. And so this is one way that we tie uh, this to the papacy. Now, Miller would count the number of the beast by, because pagan Rome is the beast, 
right? Rome is the beast. It has two phases. And I'll show you that in just a second. But if you were to count it, there you go, 508. Now the Catholics come, and then that man of sin arises. Right, so count the number of the beast. It takes you right to the number of a man. It takes you right to a man that has this number. So if you were to literally count the number of the beast, it would take you again to a man that has this number. That is interesting, isn't it? Now, we have Osiander, the Lutheran reformer, and we have the Roman historian, Livy. He provides the history. Osiander matches the prophecy with the history. History and prophecy doth agree. And going all the way back to 1511, they are aware that these seven-headed beasts were, were all Rome. The bottom picture is the papacy. The one on the far right is pagan Rome. And the one on the left is the papacy also, the woman that rides the beast. But it's all Rome in both phases, actually. Just the emphasis changes sometimes. So the emphasis on the one on the right with the dragon, the red dragon, the emphasis is given to pagan Rome, but it has the seven heads. And one of those heads is the papacy. Rome has these different forms of government, and one was an ecclesiastical government. And there's a parable. There's a riddle, too. And it starts off the same way. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. This is one of the few instances in the Bible where a double figure is utilized. It's actually the only one I know of, but I'm not saying that there aren't others. But I can't remember right now. So this is one of the few instances where a double figure is utilized. So the seven heads are seven mountains. So the heads are a figure. And now we're going to use, that we're going to transfer the figure to another figure. We're going to transfer the heads to seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And mountains, if you proof text that out, are governments. And there are seven kings. And then it tells us what they are. And they are seven kings. So seven kings, seven governments. Five are fallen and one is. So five are passed in the day of John. Five, so five of whom have already fallen. Now, they understand these to be kings, councils, decemvers. That's a committee of ten. Dictators, triumphers. That's three. Emperors and popes, right? One is. That's the imperial phase. That's where John was living in imperial Rome. So they have emperors. One. That's the one is. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the, is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. And that beast would suffer a deadly wound and come back. I think that's the best interpretation. Let's read this a very important quote from Ellen White's commentary on Revelation 10.6. This time, speaking of Revelation chapter 10, when the angel says time shall be no longer, this time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should precede the advent of the Our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time, the longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. So you have long periods that terminate in the fall of 1844. You have 6,000 years, 2520, 2450, 2300 days. So you have these uh, long periods there. And it's an interesting debate. Is the 6,000 years the longest? Is the 2520 the longest? That's an interesting um, conversation. The longest reckons to the autumn of 1844. Okay, the longest. Now, there are periods that reach between this time, 1842 and 1844. After this, time, after this period of time reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. I wonder if that's a typo. I wonder if it should just say prophetic time. When you're reaching, you're tracing down the periods. So, for instance, let's talk 2520, 677. You trace that down 2,520 years. 
A full 2,520 years takes you to the autumn of 1844. But there's also other another period that's reaching to 1842. Otherwise, that date wouldn't be there. And there's also a period called the 1335, which seems to terminate, I believe very strongly, that it terminates in the summer of 1844 with the midnight cry, blessed is he is that waiteth. And that waiting is the same as the tarrying. They're waiting for that blessing. And that's when the blessing came in the summer of 1844. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh. Okay, so continuing. So you have the 1335, which, which, which terminates in, in the summer. You have the, the longest prophetic periods tracing down to 1844. And, but you also have 1842 that has to take into consideration. There's a prophetic period that traces down to 1842. And so if you're good at Adventist history, if you're good at, if you're well-versed in the first angel's message, there should be an aha moment there. I know which prophetic period traces down to 1842. And that is the two days of Hosea, which can be found in William Millen's William Miller's dissertations and sermons, and it was uh, it, quite often you can find it in the signs of the times when they're publishing it there. So you have the 2000 years of Hosea. We're going to see that this prophecy is dealing with Rome and pagan Rome comes on the scene in 158 and you go 2000 years, you trace it down to 1842 again. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of prophetic time. So prophetic time traces to 1842, but the longest goes to 1844, right? That's what the quote is saying. That's what it's the, that's what inspiration is saying. So it's validating the 2000 years and why this is so there's, there's several reasons why this is so exciting because I don't think there's anybody out there that would accept Miller's views on the 2000 years those who labored under the first angel's messages, views on the 2,000 years, who wouldn't also accept his, their, his views on the 2520 or the 2450 or the 6,000 years or the 2,300 days, right? And so that's very good. A lot of people say, Ms. White doesn't talk about the 2520. We know that there's quotes that prove it. Here she talks about the 2,000 years of Hosea, right? Hey, there's a prophetic period that reaches to 1842. Okay, which one is that? Well, it could only be the 2,000 years of Hosea. Christ, speaking of the two days, Christ talks about the two days in, in Luke. Um, Hosea speaks of them in Hosea chapter 6. But now we know why he says unto them, go ye and tell that fox. Because a fox is a cunning animal. And it's a perfect um, metaphor for 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 one who is work who's one who's working deceitfully and that is rome so he's like go and tell rome behold i cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow and the third day i shall be perfected nevertheless i must walk today and tomorrow and the day following for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of jerusalem that's an important part to understand these two days it has something to do with prophets. He must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Continuing, O Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. So we see something about gathering people together. If they hadn't been killing the prophets, they would have been able to be gathered together. There's, a, there's something about the prophetic ministry that gathers people together. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, and verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now, I am going to read to you from 2 Ezra chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 28. Now, we can look at the book of Maccabees, and the book of Maccabees is telling us, hey, there's no prophets here. So we can say, okay, that's, that's a historical book. It reads like a historical book. 
But the book of the the second second Ezra is a prophetic book, so it's either inspired or it's not inspired. It's either heresy or it's 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 um, it should be treated like other inspired works. Now let's read from this. Thus saith the Almighty Lord: Have I not prayed you as a father his sons, as a mother her daughters, and a nurse her young babes, that ye would be my people and I should be your God? that ye would be my children and I should be your father. I gathered you together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but now what shall I do unto you? I will cast you from my face. Ye offer unto, when ye offer unto me, I will turn my face from you for your solemn feast days, your new moons, and your circumcisions have I forsaken. I sent unto you my servants, the prophets, whom ye have taken and slain and torn their bodies in pieces, whose blood I will require at your hands, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, this saith the Almighty Lord, your house is desolate, I will cast you as the wind doth stubble. Okay, so we have the prophetic ministry of Ezra here. And this is just not one sentence or one verse that's being quoted here, but this is a large body of text. If Christ just had, by happenstance, to quote uh, some apocryphal writing, then there might be some propriety to assume that he wasn't endorsing um, what what this what this person was saying, right? But Christ is prophesying, and the prophets are subject to the prophets, and so he's reiterating a prophecy. Let's look how similar they are. I gathered you together as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings. This is Ezra. I sent unto you my servants the prophets, whom ye have taken and slain and torn their bodies in pieces. Thus saith the, the Almighty Lord, your house is desolate. Now Christ, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings? And ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So he's saying the same things practically verbatim. And, and look again, that is, that's a lot of text. That's a lot of text there that's being quoted. Right? So Christ is referencing the hidden book. He absolutely is. And so we should treat the, the second book of Ezra with a lot of respect. Now let's explore this idea of gathering. What I'm trying to establish here with us is that, what I'm trying to establish here with us is that this prophecy of the two days has much to do with prophets perishing, okay? Go tell that fox, go tell Rome that I'm going to be doing these things. And why is he doing these things? Because prophets are perishing out of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you're killing the prophets. I can't gather you together because you're killing the prophets. Your house is left unto you desolate. That's what Christ is saying, right? Now, what's very interesting is that in the very year, in the very year, let's go back to uh, this slide here. In the when does the spirit of prophecy return? When does the spirit of prophecy return to the church? When does it get its gifts back? In the year 1842. After two days. That's when it returns. This would be a good time to actually go to. Let me see if I had it have it in the slide. This would be a good time to go to Hosea, because it's the same prophecy of the two days. Notice. Notice what's going to happen here. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He has smitten, and he will bind us up. So there's a call to be gathered back together. You have been smitten, you've been torn, you've been scattered. Your house has been left unto you desolate, right? You've been scattered like the wind, but now I want to gather you back together. And after two days, will he revive us? So we should expect to see that in the year 1842. We should expect to see revival. 
And the third day he will raise us up. This is talking about the resurrection. This is talking about the millennium. And just like the sixth out, there's a gap between the 6,000th year and, and the millennium, we'd also expect to see that in the second, the two days and the third day. Because the third day is also is a thousand year period. And he shall, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter, and the former rain unto the earth. Now, what happens during when the former rain and latter rain come onto the earth? What happened in the day of Pentecost? Were they not prophesying? Were they not speaking in tongues? during the former reign? And also, what does the book of Joel say in Joel chapter 2 about this latter reign experience and this former reign experience? That he's going to give us these in the first month. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams, and even your handmaidens will have visions too. So we do see that the gifts of the Spirit are still are still present in the New Testament church, and that there's a prophetic period that even takes us down to this time. Now, if I come here on the 18th of January, 1842, so the, right on time, I met with the people of God in South Ark, Boston, where the Christians were engaged in solemn prayer. I was immediately seized as in the agonies of death, and my breath left me, and it appeared to me that I was a spirit separate from my from this body. I then beheld one arrayed in white raiment, whose countenance shone beyond the brightness of the stars, and a crown was upon his head, which shone above the brightness of the sun. If you ever have a chance to read this uh, vision, it's stupendous, and I recommend that you do and study it often. This is William Foy. The, so the, the gift of prophecy is back in the church, right when we expect it to be now. What else is very interesting and what is also very important is that in May 1842, a general conference was convened in Boston, Massachusetts. At the opening of this meeting, brothers Charles Fitch and Apollos Hale of Haverville presented the pictorial prophecies of Daniel and John, which they had painted on cloth with the prophetic numbers showing their fulfillment. So the prophecy of write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. So what they did was they simplified the prophecies by making these visuals, and it's giving an extra boost to the movement. It's causing people to run to and fro. This is something also to be expected in the season of the latter rain. So two very strong evidences that we are in that period. And then just go and study uh, what was going on in 1843 and 1844, blessed are the eyes that saw the things and, uh, in 1843 and 1844. There's a blessing there, right? So there's a blessing there. Um, we know actually from history that those that labored under the midnight cry, which I was also saying the 1335 traces down to, blessed are they that waiteth and cometh to the 1335. If you made it through that tearing time, you received the... the the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, people were pros prostrated on the ground, and all fanaticism ceased. And those people were more void of human imperfection than any people since the apostolic era. And the seventh move, seventh month movement went out with the velocity of a tornado. So absolutely, absolutely were they recipients of the Holy Spirit. And the gifts were back in the church, right? And so after two days, there was the revival in history. History testifies of this amazing fact. Now, I'm going to compare early writings, page 74, with Hosea, uh, Hosea 6.1. And I'm going to put emphasis on certain words. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, that's one word, and he will heal. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. The Lord showed me that he stretched out his hand a second time to recover the remnant of his people, and that efforts must be redoubled in this gathering time, 
in the scattering, Israel was smitten and torn. But now in the gathering time, God will heal and bind up. So direct uh, reference to Hosea 6.1. Heal and bind. That's what Hosea 6.1 says. And smitten and torn. So in the scattering, they were being smitten and torn. And now in the gathering, they're being healed and binded up. God is saying, Let's, hey, return unto me. I will heal you. I will bind you up. After the two days, I will revive you. And I will give you the early and latter rain. And that was in 1842 when the chart came out. This is being written in 1850 after they splintered again after the disappointment. Right after 1842, they're gathering together. The chart is gathering the people up. It's causing people to run to and fro. The spirit of prophecy is being used now to gather up the people through the ministry of William Foy. There's a revival happening. They're coming up out of the other churches and forming and beginning to become their own body under the second angel's message. All of these things are happening. The disappointment happens. The disappointment happens and they become scattered again. And now through the now a paper comes out, word to the little flock. They're starting to they're starting to gather them under the third angel's message. And they get another chart in the year 1850. And Miss White has a spirit of prophecy now. So now they have the ministry of Miss White. They have another chart, the 1850 chart, and the glorious message of the third angel, which is the gathering angel. And now God is stretching out his hand a second time, just like he, he gathered them out of Egypt. But then they got scattered, Nebuchadnezzar and others. And then he gathered them again out of Babylon and, and brought them out of Medo Persia and back into uh, the Holy Land. So he gathered them out a second time. So just like in the Old Testament, type and anti-type, this happens also in Adventist history. He's gathered us out a second time. And so we can see it's 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 how does God gather us together? Through these um, miraculous charts, through these um, visuals, through the fulfillment of prophecy, and also through the gift of prophecy. And so this is why Christ, going back to what Christ is saying, he's saying, he's saying to them, I would have gathered you, I would have gathered you, um, but I couldn't. I would have gathered you like the chickens. I would have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. You're killing the prophets, so I can't gather you, right? And I have to do these miracles today and tomorrow for these 2,000 years because uh, I have to work now because you're killing the prophets. I can't allow these prophets to die, right? And what's interesting is that during the reign of the papacy, it said that the Bible was closed with sackcloth and ashes. So we didn't even have the words of, we didn't even have the words of the prophets at that time, let alone a prophet, right? The Bible was not, it was, it was regulated to the wilderness with small companies of people and people were scattered abroad. And that was the scattering time. But eventually, but we're not in that time anymore. We're in the gathering time now. And God is gathering us together, and we have the spirit of prophecy is back in the church. And I submit to you, now in the season of the latter rain, we are going to see more miraculous things, more cures, more uh, dreams, and I believe even visions, because the gospel will finish 10 times in 10 times more powerful than even at the in the days of Pentecost. 